The Alchemy of Finance is a book written by George Soros, a billionaire hedge fund manager and philanthropist. He's also well known as the man who broke the Bank of England for making a billion dollar profit while shorting the British pound. In the book he goes over a very unique approach to investing that he used to get great success while managing billions of dollars of client money over a period of over 40 years to great success. In this video we will go over the key ideas from the book, but before we do, feel free to subscribe for more book summaries and money and motivation related content. Takeaway number 1. Investing is a kind of alchemy. From the author's perspective, investment decisions are pretty much like making a scientific hypothesis and testing it in practice. The main difference is that hypothesis is intended to make money and not to establish a universal generalization. Both activities involve a certain risk and success brings a reward, monetary in one case and scientific in the other. With this in mind, we can look at a stock market like a laboratory for testing hypotheses. Successful investing is a kind of alchemy. It's very important to have a good hypothesis while investing. Without it, investing is like a random walk. An important thing to note here is that major successes in investing come from exploiting opportunities. One of the hardest things to judge is what level of risk is safe, as there are no universal ways to determine that, and each situation needs to be judged individually. The main reason for this is the fact that science of investing is a social science. It involves human emotions and thus is not always rational. Because it's not always rational, the rules are not set in stone. We do not have and cannot have predetermined rules and formulas like we have in physics and math, for example. So it's very important to understand that even if you had like all the correct fundamental information at hand, you would still not be guaranteed to predict the market movements correctly. Simply because social sciences have thinking participants involved in them. And the thinking is not always rational, and to make things worse, it's easily affected by many other factors. This is why the author focuses on takeaway number two, change, rather than equilibrium. We should focus on the process of change that is happening around us, much rather than a static equilibrium and the set rules around it. Our thinking affects the situation to which it relates, and there's no counterpart to this, it's also hard to define and measure. There are two key relationships in this process, the participant's efforts to understand the situation, which is a cognitive or passive function, by the way its perceptions also depend on the current situation, and the impact of their thinking on the real world, so that's a participating or an active function. Situation is also influenced by participants' perceptions. When it comes to these functions, they work in opposite directions, so in many cases they can be observed in isolation, but they also work simultaneously. When they both work at the same time, they will interfere with each other, and changes will cause even more changes. This is called reflexivity. And because of it, two recursive functions will produce a never-ending process of change instead of an equilibrium. The participant's bias is also very important in the stock market, as it affects valuations as significantly. Search for an equilibrium here can turn into a wild goose chase, and the theories about it they themselves can also be biased. People don't base their decisions on perfect knowledge, and rely a lot on what they expect to happen in future, so constantly changing expectations will lead to constantly changing outcomes. Takeaway number 3. Reflexivity in the stock market When it comes to investing in the stock market, there are two main methods of analysis that investors use. Technical analysis, which is based on market patterns and supply and demand, and fundamental analysis, which is based on true value of a stock that the stock weights to. But this actually ignores a lot of factors and events that affect stock price in real life. Well, in the author's opinion, both are flawed, and using flawed models and relying on them heavily is very dangerous. Actually, you would probably be better off not relying on any model instead. And since these models do not account for the fact that thinking participants are what's driving the market, they can't be safely relied upon. This is why he uses a different, reflexive model instead, but with a note that a reflexive model can't really take place of fundamental analysis. All it can do is provide an ingredient that's missing from it. One provides a static picture and the other a dynamic one. The proposition that the market is always right is widely accepted. However, the author doesn't accept the proposition that stock prices are a passive reflection of the underlying values, nor does he accept the proposition that the reflections tend to correspond to the underlying value. 
Instead, he believes that market values are always distorted and the distortions themselves can affect the underlying values. Changes in the stock prices are just a part of a process and the author focuses on the discrepancy between the participants' expectations and the actual events. It's possible though that the events end up corresponding to the expectations, but that's a very rare case, as the market participants are always biased in one way or another. Since the markets are always biased in one direction or another, they can influence the events that they anticipate. This is why it often appears that markets anticipate events correctly. So, the views that market participants have about the market, or in other words biases, they'll influence the course of events that are yet to happen. And when those events happen, they'll further influence the views, thus creating like self-reinforcing process. And that process is further mixed with underlying trends. Yes, there's an underlying trend that influences the stock prices, whether the investors realize it or not. And the stock prices are determined by the factors that have a reflexion relationship. So the underlying trend and the bias are both of them also influenced by the stock prices, which in turn causes what is our next takeaway, boom and bust cycles. So both the trend and the bias can be self-reinforcing or self-correcting. When a trend is reinforced, it accelerates, and when the bias is reinforced, there is a bigger discrepancy between expectations and reality. Also, the rising prices are reinforced by a positive bias, while falling prices are reinforced by a negative bias. Self-reinforcing processes are also created when trends affect biases, and the biases in turn affect trends. The positive bias, for example, will keep self-reinforcing and expectations rise even faster than the stock prices. And the trend will also become influenced by the prices and the price rises become even more dependent on the bias. This will make both trend and the bias increasingly vulnerable. This is the boom part of the cycle and the self-reinforcing makes the prices rise faster and faster until the trend can't sustain expectations anymore. When the trend can't sustain expectations, a correction appears. And since the expectations have disappointed, and this has a negative effect on the prices. And the prices also weaken the trend. And this could be the climax point towards a bust. If the trend has become too dependent on the stock prices, correction might become a total reversal. In which case prices fall even more and the trend reverses and expectations fall even further. This is the start of a self-reinforcing process in the opposite direction, that also eventually reverses again. The more easily the bias is shaken, the higher the chances are of a reversal. Now that we know how all this works, in theory, we know that we can notice the unrecognized trend at the beginning of a self-reinforcing process, and we can make use of divergence between reality and the expectations to make money on people's false assumptions and hopefully even do the same when the climax occurs and self-reinforcing process in the opposite direction is triggered. To summarize, investing is a kind of alchemy. The stock market is pretty much like a laboratory for testing hypotheses, much like in science, and major successes in investing come from exploiting opportunities. This science is a social science, it involves human emotions and it's not always rational. We can't predict the market movements correctly simply because social sciences have thinking participants involved in them. Change rather than an equilibrium. We should focus on the process of change that's happening around us rather than a static equilibrium and the rules set around it. The cognitive and the participating functions work in the opposite directions, interfering with each other and causing changes, and the changes cause even more changes. This is called reflexivity. Reflexivity in the stock market. The market is never right. Changes to the stock prices are just a part of a process. The views that market participants have about the market influence the course of events that are yet to happen. And those events, once they happen, further influence the views, thus creating self-reinforcing prophecies. Boom and bust cycles. When trends affect biases and the biases in turn affect trends, the positive bias keeps self-reinforcing and the expectations rise even faster than stock prices. The trend also becomes influenced by the prices and a strong boom is born. When the trend can't sustain expectations, a correction appears. 
And now the expectations have disappointed, which has a negative effect on the prices, and prices weaken the trend. Correction might become a total reversal, in which case prices fall even more, causing the same self-reinforcement in the opposite direction, thus a bust occurs. Uh, the kind of frustrating thing about the book is that it really doesn't tell you or even try to tell you how to actually implement any of this. It's just a collection of like abstract views and theories, pretty much stock market philosophy book. Still, I find the theories it provides very interesting and the book itself is like really difficult to read and understanding it is even harder, so like despite the lack of all the actionable advice, I still really wanted to carry on in making a summary and takeaways video for you to have as a resource. So thank you for watching and I hope this video was really useful to you, I'll leave affiliate links in the description below so you can also support the channel with no additional cost to you if you want. As a final note, let me just clarify that this is summary of a book, it's not investment advice. You should always do your own due diligence before investing, as it's your money and you and only you are responsible for the consequences of your own actions. With that out of the way, there's a new book summary out every week and much more investing and motivation related content is on the way, so feel free to leave suggestions to which book I should be reading next and what you would like to learn about finance and motivation. Also, leave a like on the video and share it with a friend so you can help them also. I'll see you next week, so enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye!